Guys. No. We're live. Okay, hello everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good good evening. I don't know who is listening to us. Um, it is the second session of our conference. We started this morning with uh, a, a presentation that I made and Andrea made a presentation about Cavell. And for this afternoon, we have a talk called uh, Cavell and the Everyday of Thinking with Eric Ritter. I will introduce him in a minute. So uh, perhaps we will put you all backstage now. Okay, so see you soon. Just a minute. Oh, Richard is here. Hello, Richard. So, okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. I want, you know, this is is not the opening. We already had the opening, but I just want to say to, to everybody, since we're speaking English now, that I'm very happy uh, to, to be the co-host of this conference. Cavell is very important for myself in my own work. And uh, I think, especially in Brazil, we are just beginning to, to investigate his work. So it's great to have you all here. Arata is arriving. Hello, Arata. And um, we, we will start with Eric, and he will present a short uh, in talk about his work with Cavell's literary legacy. Eric Hitter is a scholar, writer, activist. He received his PhD from the Vanderbilt University Philosophy Department in 2019, and he has been a visiting doctor doctoral fellow at the University of Chicago Center for German Philosophy and the Freie University of Berlin since 2017. In addition to his scholarly work, he has worked on various research and policy coalitions around justice reform in Greater Nashville. He's currently, currently lecturer and visiting scholar at the Vanderbilt University Philosophy Department. Uh, so Eric, it's a pleasure to have you here and uh, I will leave you with the floor, so to speak, and we are, after your talk, we will get back to, for a conversation. Should I put your presentation on screen? Um, sure, that would be wonderful. So please go ahead. Do I have the power to um, change the, the slides, you Yes, yeah, yes. Whatever you do on your screen, we'll, we will see. Great. Well, hello everybody, um, and uh, thank you for, for coming. And Jonas, thank you so much for, for organizing this workshop. Um, this is going to be just a brief presentation. Um, as I'm sure everybody here knows, um, Stanley Cavell um, um, died in uh, 2018, and um, his uh, wonderful family was looking for some help from, at the time, from graduate students or, or very young postdocs to help um, organize his papers so that they could have a sense of what was there um, uh, before donating or, 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 or um, giving Cavell's papers to a, a archive or, or research library. So um, I had the amazing opportunity to um, help the Cavell family kind of inventory and organize Cavell's literary estate. And I think that in many ways I'm still processing um, everything that I learned from being so intimate and close with Cavell's everyday process of writing and working and thinking. And I'm looking forward to, to sharing some photographs and saying a little bit about the, the project that I, that, I, that I did there and then to having a discussion with, with you all about it. So the title of my talk is Cavell and the Everyday of Thinking. And um, this is where Cavell lit, uh, wrote in Brookline, Massachusetts, um, in short walk to, to, to Harvard University, where he worked for, for over 50 years, um, or a short drive, excuse me. And it, the study that, that this photograph, uh, and where the majority of the photographs you're about to see, you know, um, this is where he lived in, and wrote for 50 years. 
So there was material all the way back from his graduate school days. Um, and this window right here is overlooking a, uh, a um, walking path that can take you straight to Fenway Park. And uh, you could even hear the cheers um, sometimes coming from, coming from that baseball stadium. So let's go ahead and get started here. Um, from June 2019 to March 2020, thanks to a generous grant from Vanderbilt University, um, I worked with the Cavell family to organize and archive the Cavell Literary Estate. In the process, um, I think no one was quite expecting this. I found a surprising amount of uncollected and unpublished material and documented it along with the executive of Cavell's Literary Estate, Kathleen Cavell, who many of you know perhaps, and her son, David. Um, this work got interrupted because of COVID-19. So as you can see, this project sort of stopped in March, 2020. I will come back to, to, to this at the end of the talk. Again, this is Cavell's primary writing desk. And, and um, so, so here's a photograph of the study as you walk in. Um, as you can see, there are quite um, a few books. Um, this, this would be if you're standing where that writing desk was more or less and looking back out. Um, and you know, when, when I arrived in, in June of 2019, um, there, there essentially, uh, nothing had been touched since, since Cavell passed away. And yet the strange thing for me, and unlike some folks here, Arata, and I don't know if Jim is here and others who who worked closely with Cavell and who knew him quite well. I did. I had the chance to meet him once. I did not know him very well. But the strange thing about about this project was that it really felt like he had just gone out for a cup of coffee. I mean, very little had been touched in his study, and I could see why um, the, the the Cavell family needed a someone who 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 knew Cavell's work and who had some time and and you know did not yet have a family and so forth, because the. the the, the project was really enormous. Nothing had been touched. There, there was no yet um, organization or, or any kind of order given to, to, to Cavell's papers. And so my first step was to basically ask the experts. So I had extensive conversations with the um, Vanderbilt um, librarians, special collections in particular, who were wonderful with their time and who had done projects like this before. And they stepped, they walked me through, you know, in terms of materials that needed to be purchased in terms of how to go about doing this. Um, uh, the next thing I did, or really at the same time, was ensure that all digital files were backed up. Um, uh, that actually had not yet happened. So, so I, you know, made sure that we weren't going to lose anything, the, the community that, that cares about Cavell's work. And finally, what I did and sort of what you're looking at now is I took photographs. I spent two or three days taking photographs of everything in the study before I had you know, even started to, to move anything around. The idea here being that perhaps uh, those who, 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 for whom this was important could, could take a look at those photographs and you know, know what the study looked like before I made any kind of hint. Also, it's just sort of lovely because it, it shows the condition of the study at a time close to when Cavell was, was using it. So this is another photograph that shows you the back of the back of the study with the computer desk there, as well as those file drawers. Um, those file drawers became my close friend um, because they were filled to the brim with with papers that needed to be inventoried and organized. Um, one thing that's worth just pointing out is this: the back this back wall here was really sort of like a reference library. This was, I would say, the the kind of history of philosophy section of Cavell's study stuff that he wasn't using every day had fewer marginalia, fewer annotations but it was stuff that you could just see him walking back, you know, and, and consulting it. Um, it really felt like here was his personal library of really largely the history of philosophy, that, that back shelf in particular. Um, so many texts, both primary and secondary, you know, and, and of course, as, as everybody here knows, the wonderful thing about, about Stanley Cavell's work is that 
it's not just one tradition. So, you know, in addition to classics of 20th century analytic epistemology, we also had, you know, um, sort of uh, history of, of Jewish philosophy and, and the history of continental philosophy. So, so it was that 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 broad-minded uh, uh, that various fields um, that Cavell worked were really on full display in, in his study. Here's a little bit of a close-up on his computer desk. Obviously, for most of his life, he did not use a computer, but uh, you know, certainly, let's say for his autobiography, he wrote primarily on his computer. Um, but um, he he wrote a lot by hand, even towards the end of his life. In in fact, I would say the majority of materials in the study were 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 by hand. And um, here behind the computer uh, was a sort of German philosophy test tech. Uh, uh, shelf. Works of Arendt, Heidegger, Nietzsche, Schiller, Simmel, Schulem, Benjamin. Um, and, you know, many of these books, just, you know, to, to think about what's in our future as those who, who love Cavell, just full of his lively, vibrant annotations. And I can talk a little bit more about, about you know, what I, what I saw in terms of um, the, the annotation style and, and his practice of, of taking notes. Um, here, as I mentioned, these were my close friends, these 25 file drawers full of paper files. They really testify to, you know, almost, you know, 70 years spent teaching, writing, and thinking. Um, you can see that I numbered these files because with advice from Vanderbilt Special Collections librarians, um, you know, every file that I took out, it became, it, it, I made it clear where I had found it in the study, including which particular drawer. And for the 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 stuff that was harder to find, which I'll talk about in, in a moment, you know, there was uh, some organization system here, but but there, it was certainly not organized by you know in, in any kind of systematic way. Eric, sorry, Oops. but ah, okay, we were not seeing the file, so okay, probably. thank you. Now no, <laughs> I had forgotten. Please let me know if I do that again because I'm I'm doing this with two screens here. Yes. No worries. Um, so here here are the file drawers, and here you can see the numbers um, that I used, and um, you can maybe just get a sense of just the volume of of paper that was sort of everywhere. So here is just a, another table in his study, um, full of papers, miscellaneous items. Um, this uh, ultimately um, we used this table um, to to basically keep track of, of what you know for those of us Cavell Cavell scholars. What might be the most precious materials. So his copy of J.L. Austin's How to Do Things with Words, his copy of Emerson's Essays, The Investigations, Being in Time, and so forth. These well-loved books that the spines were quite literally falling off. Um, so that's primarily what we, what I ended up using this table in his study for. Here, um, excuse me just one second. Here, just this is another example of this was a shelf that's more in the middle of the room. You know, here's here's a copy of Austin's How to Do Things with Words, um, kind of hidden there. There, one in, one thing that I was slightly surprised by is, um, you know, Cavell didn't seem to to have one prized copy of any of his favorite thinkers. He he definitely worked in in various editions and various texts, um, and. Here, you know, here's a copy of Schopenhauer next to a copy of Levinas, and 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 I think it was it's pretty clear that you know this shelf in particular was uh, materials he was using when he was writing some of the essays for Philosophy the Day After Tomorrow. So here's a, a sense of of what the the floor of the study looked like. You know, by the end of that first summer, there were. Um, 24 archival boxes full of paper files sorted by um, 
by categories provided to us by the librarians, um, as well as about half a dozen or more of these smaller archival boxes, which are acid-free to protect papers um, that are older or more fragile. Uh, so this ends up being, you know, more than 20 linear feet of, of paper. It's quite a bit. Each box or most of the boxes had an in inventory that I uh, created um, as well as in with inside each box has this blue file folder that says where in the study the papers were found. So within each box, uh, which is itself organized by, as you see, um, um, archival category, it's also possible to trace back where in the study I found um, each individual paper. As um, you know, many of you already know that the study was not the only room, is not the only room in the Cavell's house uh, that is full of books. Here's an example um, of uh, a different room in the house, which I'm not showing all of for, for privacy reasons, but this uh, is sort of like the French philosophy shelf. So here we have Derrida and Foucault and um, clearly work that he was using for, um, for the uh, melodrama of the Unknown Women uh, uh, book in the early 90s. Another thing I would, I just would, and, and here, got ahead of myself there. Um, here is the music room. Uh, several photographs of, wonderful photographs of Cavell and um, or him standing by this piano. Um, music was obviously so, so important for Cavell, especially in the last decade of his life. He wrote a lot about music. He studied music regularly. Um, these are musical scores here, um, not just classical, but also jazz. Um, and even, you know, a, a lovely note is, you know, even toward the end of his life, as his memory faded, um, Cavell never lost the ability to play jazz show tunes um, on the piano. And um, I, there are some recordings of him at the piano. And, and those of, you know, I, I'm not one of was not lucky enough to have him as a teacher, but uh, I have heard stories of him, you know, walking over to the piano during class. Here is perhaps uh, maybe the most exciting thing, in, in, in my opinion, um, that will be a part of Cavell's literary state. This was the shelf closest to his desk. So if you recall back to the first slide with the bay windows, this was, if you're sitting in the chair directly to the right. Um, on top here are all of Cavell's own books, which especially towards the end of his life, and I have the sense not, not just towards the end of his life, where he was regularly rereading and consulting. You know, I just, the, the sort of autobiographical self-referential self style that, you know, all of us know so well, has a kind of physical analog here in, in this top shelf. Um, they're also filled with his notes. Um, and you really could feel in, in, in this respect and in many others, the perfectionism, the ethical practice of reading and writing philosophy. Um, uh, and, and another thing worth pointing out, also extremely, I think, exciting from a scholarly perspective is dozens and dozens of journals here. Um, if you've spent time with uh, the journals of someone like uh, Emerson or, or Thoreau, um, to my mind, they, they really call to mind that kind of daily practice of writing, working on form. You know, he would clearly lift sentences from his journals and put them into his finished work, just like Thoreau and Emerson. <laughs> Excuse me for that. Um, you know, and the journals are not just reflections on, on the history of philosophy and, and what he's reading, although they are that. He's also working through, you know, everyday life and ordinary experience, often with the help of, 
of texts and, and figures from the history of philosophy. So as you might imagine, I learned Cavell's handwritings because they are quite difficult and challenging. Um, and they also changed over time. So this, this was a really, this is just a really exciting part of his study. Here's just a photograph of, of what his desk looked like um, with a little more clarity. Um, you know, I, before even, again, before, before doing anything in the study, it's a photograph of what his desk looked like. He had, you know, not only many of his own books to his side, but also right there on the desk. And ultimately, I'm moving towards the end here. I'm looking forward to, to a conversation. Um, ultimately, during this process, I, I found unpublished or unfinished writings on Austin, Dewey, Derrida, music, psychoanalysis, Shakespeare, and more. Um, I also found a volume um, called Here and There, Sites of Philosophy, um, which Cavell made extensive plans to publish in the late 1990s, but never in fact did. Uh, throughout his study, there were four slightly different tables of contents on the volume, as well as extensive correspondence with his editor about it. At the same time, he was working on his autobiography, traveling back and forth to Chicago, preparing Emerson's Transcendental Etudes and Cavell on film. And so I think this book of essays here and there, Sites of Philosophy, just sort of slipped through the cracks. Um, he clearly wanted it to, to come out, and ultimately several of the more well-known, well, at this point, obviously, well-known essays um, were published in Philosophy Today After Tomorrow. Nevertheless, across the four tables of contents, there were 13 essays which had never been published before, never been published in English. And um, here and there, Sites of Philosophy is now in the process of post posthumous publication. So that was an extremely exciting find. And that just brings us back to, to this writing desk. Um, and I will just say, you know, I don't think this would be news for, the, for, for many people here, but one thing that was um, quite resonant after doing this work was the, uh, let's say the ever present nature of ethics uh, and of perfectionism in what Cavell was and moral perfectionism uh, in, in Cavell's sense of philosophy. Um, I, there it was so clear that, that the reading and writing meant something to him, something more than just a puzzle or a status symbol. Um, I think, you know, it was so clear that his practice of reading and writing philosophy moved him from here to there from one next to another, to use the language of, of Emersonian perfectionism. And I'll just end with this note, which was, you know, strangely and getting so close to one of, you know, my personal philosophical heroes after his death, it became clear that imitating him would lead nowhere. As his conception of philosophy was firmly rooted um, in something close to, to his, own, his own life, his own personality. Um, his final gift was to have successfully utterly left me to myself while still serving as an exemplar. And thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. That was great. Let me put some people back here and then perhaps we can start a conversation. If you prefer not to, just let me know. Let me take the presentation off. And I just want to say, perhaps in order to start, is that in my own case, I, I also never had the chance, or you had once the chance of meeting Carvel. I never had that chance. So for me, uh, we already discussed a little bit this before, and Eric showed me some of those pictures before, and it was just, you know, an amazing experience for me to, to feel a little closer to the to the man, to, to, to his his work, actually, because basically all I know about Cavell is from his writings. I don't even know that much about his personal life. And it was quite nice to, to have this uh, secondhand, at least, experience of uh, seeing where he was working and what he was working on. 
Um, I'm, I perhaps would have one question, but I'm not sure if you can, uh, if, if you have a, if you thought about this, but you said something in the beginning about his change from, from writing by hand and writing on his computer. And this is something that I am personally interested in. If you notice, if you can perhaps notice some, some kind of difference in style or content because of that change in you know, material conditions for writing. Because in my own life, I basically, since the beginning of my studies, as I was writing on, on a computer. So as you know, we can't just copy, paste, change everything. There is no, um, there is no need to think that much before you commit it to paper. So to, there is no paper to commit it to. And I, I wonder if that it's something that you notice some change in, in Capital's style because of that, or, or if not, or if he just kept doing what he was always doing only in a computer now. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, I guess one one way to start thinking about that, um, he he certainly um, edited a lot by hand. I think even when he was writing on the computer. So even you know the many many drafts of the auto, autobiography, uh, clearly he was he was making meticulous word choices. He was editing um, for style just as much as for content. Um, even when he was writing on the computer. That's not at all an answer to your question you had asked, but it's a start. No, but I, I thought the question would be, you know, the, it depends on a, a deeper analysis than you had time to do. But I was just curious because this is, you know, a problem that I suppose there is some Cavalian resonance with the idea that material conditions could change your way of writing and the content, what you write. But, but that's something that I am wondering. So is there any questions? Uh, I, I think Arata was also a student of Cavell, right? Arata. And I don't know about Richard, but perhaps if, if you could take this opportunity, since we are kind of restarting the, the conference with some biographical information and, and say something about uh, Cavell, I, I would love to hear you, but we, we perhaps discuss with Eric. Um, well, sure. I can. can everyone hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I, you know, I. <laughs> um, well, thanks a lot for that, Eric. Um, uh, that was uh, really something. I, um, I, um, sort of uncanny, you know, for for me, since you know, I, I spent some time in that house. Um, see those pictures. Um, uh, actually, I actually haven't been in the house since um, Cavell's death, and um, so it's um, and um, I, I guess one thing you didn't talk, and this is like the geography, so to speak, of the house. I mean, um, the his study was upstairs, of course, um, and uh, and then when I went over. I, I mean, it was just a practice, you know, that he would meet his students at his house. Um, uh, and often, like, students would come over, go over to his house, and um, and then, you know, if it was near lunchtime, um, which is often the case, <laughs> actually, um, uh, you know, I, we would go over to um, uh, his uh, favorite Chinese restaurant, or maybe the fav favorite sort of local restaurant. I'm sure you've, um, uh, many people have heard about this. Um, and uh, and we go into the restaurant, and you know everyone who worked there knew Stanley by name. Um, he was like he was a regular there. Um, I don't know if he ever went there on his own, um, but it seems like like uh, my friends who are fellow graduate students, they all every time they went to go see Cavell, they would all end up at the Chinese restaurant. You know. <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, so, but, but we'd also, you know, like all the students would spend time, um, in Cavell's house, um, uh, inside it, usually in, in the, his, the dining room area, which was, is adjacent to the, what you were calling the music room, um, or just, it's fairly continuous with it, right? And, um, 
Uh, and one like striking thing about it was that, that, that the students were like invited into his home and into his life. You know, so there, it wasn't, um, I mean, I didn't, you know, there's, um, you know, some professors would have students over to their house, you know, if they work particularly closely with them, you know, eventually, but, but at least initially, you know, they would meet in at, at school, you know, in the department office. Um, I think my sense is that with Cavell, it was like immediately, you know, the students would be invited to his house. Um, and then like when you got there, um, life was going on inside the house, you know, so um, sometimes Kathleen would be there. Sometimes, you know, um, these, you know, uh, when I was a grad student, David and Ben were were still um, uh, growing up, you know, um, and uh, seemed like they grew up like disconcertingly quickly from my point of view. But but anyway, <laughs> they um, and so you'd be like sort of thrust into into his life, you know, and um, and like you said, you know, I think like life and philosophy were for him just kind of inseparable. Um, and it was just, and that was like exhibited in, in his practice, you know, the way that, that he sort of invited students in. Um, all, all the students, you know, like immediately um, uh, got to know Kathleen the same time <laughs> that you got to know Stanley. Um, uh, and then often, you know, you go to the Chinese restaurant, we come back, you know, and sit around and just, um, chat you know in the dining room um uh and sometimes it would just you know like kathleen would participate too so <laughs> um and so yeah i mean it was really incredibly lovely you know the way that um you sort of invite a student in um but but like i think i i went up stairs to his study i think once i think he had he he was looking for a book or something like that, but but in general, like I um I never really got a good look at the study, you know where he where he worked, and I, I don't know if yet I don't know how much he worked in the study versus you know working in in um the kitchen. I don't know um if you you probably know more about this than I do, Eric. Um uh I um but you know as you mentioned, like there are like, like tons of books in the study, and it there was evidence that he uh, that, that there was like papers lying around sometimes, you know, around the table. And so there was evidence that he worked, you know, in, in both places. Um, uh, but yeah, and the other, like, he he did have an office, right? And um, he had a ton, he had tons of books in his office as well. I mean, it, so like one question I had was just, you know, um, did, I, I, you know, I imagine that, that that I, I'm sure that there that at this point he did that office is no longer there. I mean, physically it's there, but it's no longer, you know, it wasn't preserved in the way that that his study was preserved. Um, so do you know what happened to the the contents of the office? Did they did they move into um, were they moved into his study? And was there any um, uh, um a record kept, you know, of what was in his office versus what was like in his study. I mean, I have a bunch of questions, but that, that's sort of, yeah, like just a simple question. Um, thanks, Arata. I, I think that I, I know there are photographs of um, David and Kathleen and Stanley moving them and David's wife uh, moving them out of moving excuse me, moving Stanley out of the office, moving Cabell out of the office. Um, but I don't think any record was made in terms of what books or papers were there as opposed to what was in the house. I certainly don't have that, don't have that record. So I don't think that it exists. Uh -huh. I see. Um, I do remember, um, I think it might have been with, I don't remember if it was with Jim Conant or with Stephen Affelt, um, or maybe it was with both. Um, that at, at one point, like Stanley wanted some stuff moved from the office, um, and uh, like packed up in the boxes. So I remember like helping out with that, um, but I, I don't remember really anything more than that. Um, uh, but 
because you know I don't I don't think he worked in his office that much. I didn't. Um, he didn't really seem to to spend a lot of time in his office. Um, even when he came into the department to teach, um, uh, it almost seemed like it was a place where he would just like leave stuff. <laughs> um, uh, so um, yeah. I, um, but did you, I, I guess one question I have is, um, I mean, it's a pr pretty basic question. Did he leave any um, instructions about, or guides himself, um, uh, you know, with regard to his literary state and, or, or, or is it just, um, yeah, I mean, did you get, did you have any guidance, you know, either from him or from anybody else um, about how to proceed? Yeah. Um, so you, Kat, Kathleen, his wife, was just, is a literary executor, um, and she, um, you know, w as I was talking to the Vanderbilt librarians, I, you know, g gave her the big picture plans and everything was kind of okay by her. There were several people that dropped by over the summer um, who live in Boston um, to just kind of see what was going on. Um, but as far as, you know, details of what he wanted done with the papers or anything like that, that is totally in the hands of the literary executor and um, not a lot of explicit direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I have more questions, but I, you know, I should let others. No, I can hear what, 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 what One question I would have, I, again, I, I'm not sure how much of this Eric is really, uh, is not on his purview, but do you have any sense of what we can see published in the future besides that volume, like original papers, collections, and on topics perhaps or just a curiosity sure yeah i mean that decision will not be up to me but um in terms of what i found doing this project um not only was there the book here and there sites of philosophy there were the journals um there was um unpublished essays on austin um one or two on smaller stuff on emerson and shakespeare um, an unfinished essay on Dewey, you know, very late 2008. There were wonderful letters to to everybody whom you would imagine, um, including some some real rock stars, you know, like um, a couple directors. So I think there's a lot in terms of um, what what could be um, interesting. Um, and and you know, um, someone asked me, you know, okay, so there's unpublished stuff. Is there anything new? And that's, I think, a difficult question for Cabell, and one that I hope to to get some clarity on, you know, during this workshop. But he was constantly going over the ground that he had already himself traced. But I think he was doing that in order to then move forward. So I, I don't. I think even um, in the last the, the the stuff that he was writing towards the end of his towards the end of his life, there's a lot of new new thoughts to share. Um, so, yeah, short answer, Yonadas, not up to me, but in terms of what I found, an extraordinary um, amount of, of work. Of course, thank you. Uh, Fernando, I think, has a question. No, actually, my question was pretty much the same you asked right now, so never mind. Um, I, I would have a very uh, a quick question, M maybe a bit hard, but let's see. Uh, how exactly did you feel being there? Because there is something so very personal about being someone, someone's library, someone's personal library, and seeing the way they pack their books, what books they put together, um, what other stuff there was there. I saw there were instruments around the house. So how exactly did you feel? Because um, 
it is always something so personal, but Cavell's writing is also that. I feel like I was never so much in touch with a philosopher who's not from anywhere near where I live, who I never met, who I will never get the chance to meet, even. And still, when I read him, I feel um, close to him, even when I don't understand him at all. <laughs> so uh, I would like to know, how exactly did you feel? Because even seeing the images here in Brazil, I feel something kind of bittersweet, you know? Yeah, I mean, I would like to discuss that 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 form of his philosophy more. Um, but in terms of how I how I felt, you know, um, it was a project. It was it was work, and I wanted to do it very well. And I didn't. I tried not to, um, you know, make it about me. But um, but uh, you know, the family would tease me because at the beginning of the project, I actually um, took my shoes off every day before going into the study. I felt very much like I was entering a, a, some sort of ground that was, you know, that I needed to tread lightly on, literally. Um, but I, I will say, and I do have a piece coming out about this, you know, being that, that close to, to Cavell's work, um, seeing his meta philosophy in action, so to speak, um, it it was a real shock to the system at um, of in terms of the futility of imitating him. There was a there was really a sense that this was a perfectionist practice that was a part of his life, like Arata was saying, and 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 of course we, we you know can seek to understand that, but. In terms of one's own philosophy, it felt very much like, even though I was getting so close to it, I was also uh, drifting apart or, or finding distance. Oh, Richard, we, we're not hearing you, Richard, sorry. <laughs> no. You are not muted, but we can hear you. Perhaps you can take the, the plug of the... Oh, that's... Uh... You know. Perhaps you have to, I don't know, who knows. Turn on the microphone on your computer. I have no idea. It depends on your. Maybe it would be quicker if you just um, type his question in the private chat. It's on the right side of your screen. Yeah, that could work. Uh, I just turned on. Oh, now it's on. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a bit changing the subject, but I'd be curious to know, Eric, more details about how you got involved in this project. Uh, what your background in Cavell studies was, who your teachers were, uh, how much Cavell work you did prior to getting involved in this project, and so forth. I think my best qualification was time. Um, but I, I, I say that sort of tongue in cheek. Um, so my, my Cavell background is, um, I wrote my undergraduate honors thesis on Cavell um, was uh, then went to the Chicago conference in 2012 on his work in aesthetics and, and met him and um, really learned a lot from that conference. I kind of drifted away from Cavell in graduate school. Um, and then, you know, in the last two years realized that it was really Stanley Cavell who had, who had shown me a possibility of something that I wanted to, to do with philosophy. And um, I started writing on him during my last two years of graduate school. So my, my dissertation was on Cavell and skepticism. Um, um, and I met the family at a um, conference on Cavell's work at UC Santa Barbara in spring of 2019. So just a few months before I started this, this project. And I will say, if I hadn't been writing, if I hadn't just finished the dissertation on Cavell, this whole work would have been impossible. I mean, it, I think that it would have taken, you know, 10 times as long just because I had a good sense of, of what this, you know, where, 
if I found a, a, some notes to, to something that was clearly had to do with cities of words or with his autobiography or with must we mean what we say, it was pretty clear to me what it, what it was. I, I have perhaps one comment, it's not a question, but you said something about the futility of imitating Cavell's style. And I was called of, uh, so when I was writing my PhD dissertation, about Cavell at some point. It was initially supposed to be about Wittgenstein and then I kind of discovered Cavell and it changed completely. His, his reading of Wittgenstein from the reading I was used to. And I inevitably I had to change my style for some reason. I, I, and perhaps at some point I was trying to imitate Cavell or something like that. And I remember my supervisor, Paulo Faria, saying something like, we don't, we don't want to write like Cavell. <laughs> or, or something like that. And I was shocked and I, and I started to think about that. And, and I don't know what exactly he meant by that, but um, I think, I, I don't know if I speak for anyone else here, but there is some kind of temptation to do that. I think there is with Wittgenstein too. And some, some of his pupils did precisely that. And I, I think Anscombe, for example, is her style is so close to Wittgenstein's own. And Cavell has his own style. It, it's, it's kind of difficult. I remember reading The Claim of Reason for the first time and just, you know, it was just impossible to understand for some reason or to follow. I was expecting something much more, you know, closer to analytic philosophy perhaps. But then you do that again and again and again. At, at some point things start to work and there is a, a a temptation. How can you write philosophy once you become aware of the need to pay attention to the temptations and the voice of correction, you know, and, and uh, so this is it's just a comment, as I said, but uh, it, I think it is a temptation for someone who is as uh, impressed by Cavell's work to start doing that. And, and perhaps you can say something about what, what was the solution in your case, or, or what you tried to do not to imitate Cavell? Um, I don't have a good answer to that. I, I would be interested in, in how other people have, have solved that problem in their own cases. I do, I would like to raise the question of whether that perceived closeness that Cavell makes you uh, feel or experience as you're reading him, you know, can best be understood as a kind of form, you know, a, 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 a almost like a literary form of, of philosophy. But in terms of the, your specific question, Jonas, I don't, um, I don't have a good answer to that. I don't, I don't know if I have, it's just something that bothers me. But uh, I, I, I had to think about that for some time. So. Well, any other questions, comments? I have a, a quick question. It's um, going back to what you should be discussing in the beginning about um, your findings, Eric. Um, and thank you for the presentation. It was lovely to see and to um, learn about it. You said um, that there are um, marginalia in copies of books that he returned to over the years. Do you think those materials, um, I don't know, are, are, are worthy of being collected and being, uh, if not published um, by a press, I don't know, made available online? Is there any plan to digitize the, the, the materials? I mean, what, what really is the plan um, for those papers? I mean, it's great that they're being kept by a library, but it would be better, especially in days of Corona, if they were scanned and uh, made available to everyone. I mean, in particular cases, I can imagine it would be interesting um, to check you know, when you read a paragraph in, in, in Austin, in, in Wittgenstein, in Heidegger, 
what did Cavell have to have to say about that? And it would be nice if we could just open his the digitized copy of his uh, work and look. So can you tell us a bit about the plans? You know, a lot of these discussions got interrupted due to COVID. So, uh, you know, I didn't even finish the, the inventory. Um, so I don't think there are any, any plans at this point, but that would definitely be something that would be better asked to the, to the literary executor. I, but Gilly, um, on your, your question about, do I think it's would be worthwhile to have that? I feel resounding yes for the Cavell scholarship and for, you know, for teaching Cavell to be able to say, you know, you think, you know, spending an hour with uh, Heidegger is a lot in prep for, for this class. Take a look at, you know, section 22 of Being in Time. And, and the it, one thing that was very clear was to me was, well, two things about his marginalia. One was he would go in these cycles. So you could see like through the colored pencil or through the, 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 the different, you know, kinds of pencils he was using the rounds of reading. Um, it, you can date them obviously, but you could get a vague sense. And then the other thing was um, page numbers in the, in the margins. So he'd underline words and then circle it. And then in the margins, he, he'd write a page number. And then if you go to that page number, you found a reference to the page you were just on. And then you could sort of trace his connection. And often, you know, just like reading him, that connection was not clear until he made it clear. And then it seemed as if it was, you know, like a color right in front of you. Um, so yes, that I think it would be really valuable. And um, I think those conversations are just got put on hold. Um, can I follow up on that? Um, so, yeah, just to follow up on what um, Gilly was uh, asking. Um, so I think you mentioned that there were like some course notes, um, lecture notes and like preparatory notes for courses in the files as well. Um, I guess like one question I have is like how far back those go. Um, and, and, you know, I know that, like he, he gave a number of courses, for example, on, you know, when I was, in grad school there, I, you know, he gave a number of courses on Lacan, but he hasn't actually written that much on Lacan. Um, uh, he gave, you know, a number of courses on Heidegger, um, gave one course on being in time, he gave a course on um, uh, some of Heidegger's later writings. Um, uh, I think there was a whole entire seminar on um, Heidegger's Nietzsche books. Um, and you know, and he told me that that when he was at Berkeley, um, when he was starting out his teaching career, um, uh, his the first course he had he, he was assigned was um, a course in the Critique of Pure Reason. Um, and you know, I remember like he told me a little bit about how he did that course, but but you know, I it would be really cool to you know, I, in to see you know like. Um, his lecture notes or, or or course prep notes, you know, for for those, you know, things that he didn't, um, you know, publish that much about. I mean, you know, obviously these these figures were very influential for him, um, and they did, you know, inform his writing. But um, uh, as far as like explicit mention of them, there's not that much. It seems like in his writings. Um, uh um so i guess you know the question is like how how much of that stuff is there is just you know a question i mean i guess there's a further question of like wh whether it should be published how it should be published if not published you know how else should it be made available you know in, in a library and and if so how you know like how should you know how should it be organized and so on i mean there's like a lot of sort of questions that would need to be answered but um uh but that could be, you know, very useful, I think, for you know, for future studies of Cavell, where those notes, if they exist, you know, to be like made available in some form. I mean, um, 
Um, Arata, we can speak privately, but I would say, you know, I would encourage, if you if you have time, I would encourage you to get in touch with get back in touch with Kathleen on on, the, on that. I can say that they are all they're all they're all there. I mean, I can I know the Lacan seminar is there. Um, tons of notes on being in time, and and now that I'm thinking about it, the Heidegger Nietzsche seminar is also there. Mm -hmm. what, what about the what is a critique of pure reason? The, that that goes way back. So I'm just I, don't, I was I was wondering just how far back it go uh, these these notes go. I well I personally think that that your work on his uh, Kantian uh, in 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 he is maybe clearer than his own understanding of it. But um, sure. I'm just thinking I'm saying that somewhat facetiously. I'm I'm thinking back and and I think there are yes early notes that were difficult to decipher on the on the critique of of pure reason. That would be quite a project to um, to, tr to to transcribe those notes and and but 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 yes, they're there. Mm. Just a, a, another curiosity, but connected to this is in his digital files, or perhaps Arata knows about some some somewhere else. Is are there recordings, like audio recordings, of his lectures? That perhaps we could find somewhere. I, I I just saw him on two or three YouTube videos. It would be wonderful to have you know, a recording of his lectures. Yeah, I, I would. That's a good question. I mean, I I know that um, like just having attended you know many of his classes, I uh, I know that there's there were students who recorded them. Um, I don't know if those recordings still exist. You know, they were on you know cassette tapes for okay, the most part. Yeah. Um, uh, um, I don't, you, yeah. you know, there are Bernstein tapes and things like that. So perhaps who knows some, some Pavel <laughs> tapes come up at some point. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, you know, these were mostly students, you know, I think who were recording the, the classes, um, uh, and, you know, like, I mean, students like move around a lot. I think you know they like um, you know move from place to place year by year. They get kicked out of their apartment or something for some reason, and they have to move. Um, and so they're like, I could imagine that it would be very easy, even if they wanted to, you know, to keep these tapes. That yeah. these tapes could sort of be lost in the process. I know that like I taped a bunch of stuff. I don't know if I I don't remember if I taped anything, any of Cavell's classes, but. Um, I have no idea where any of those tapes are. So <laughs> I think well, I, I probably did tape some of some of Cavell's classes actually. If you are a student, a former student of Cavell and you are hearing this conversation and you have tapes, <laughs> please let us know. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh. I think we are more or less uh, on time. Or, or, would you like to have some final words, maybe, Eric? Or if you don't, the only thing I would say is um, I, you know, hope that these, you know, materials, you know, become public and that we can continue to discuss them uh, because there's so much to learn from them. Yeah, I share the feeling. Well, thank you again, Eric, for this wonderful presentation. Thanks, everybody, for being here and discussing. And uh, we will meet in about one hour, uh, 4 p.m. local time, to discuss Fernando's paper. So please come back if you can. See you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>